Let's pray. So, Lord, um, as we get an opportunity to work through this psalm, the psalm of David, Psalm 59, I pray that you would help us to put ourselves in David's shoes, to, to sense what he sensed, to, to feel some of the things that he was feeling, to see the way he saw, and to be able to deal with the stressors, the troubles, the tri trials that we have in our lives. I thank you for the psalms, Father. There's such a beautiful uh, tool you've given us. I thank you for the psalmist openness to share their deepest fears, their deepest hurts, their deepest questions, their deepest doubts. And I thank you for allowing us to use this tool to learn more about you and learn more about how we can live this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I, I wonder, how do, you, how do you ever feel if you've ever been hunted, trapped? If you're being accused of something that you did not do, how do you tend to respond? How do you tend to respond when you're threatened? How do you tend to respond when you're desperate? David is, is desperate. He is desperate because he is going through an immense trial and he just doesn't know what's happening. So let's, so for your reading time, if you would like, you can write down uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19 verses 11 through 18 is really where we're going to be looking in this psalm um, and the historical backdrop of this psalm. Now, as you think about that um, historical backdrop, if you remember, right after, right after David slew Goliath, you remember the women of the town were saying, David has, um, Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his what? Ten thousands. Now, can you imagine, I mean, the pride and the arrogance that we have in our leaders today, some of our leaders are really pompous, right? Can you imagine if some underling, some guy, little kid comes in and now he is getting everybody praising him and the leader of this nation is, is I, I get thousands, he gets tens of thousands. Now, if you remember, Saul had said, whoever kills Goliath gets my daughter in marriage. So David is not just a man who won the battle with Goliath. David is Saul's son-in-law, believe it or not. And so David is son Saul, uh, Saul's son-in-law, but now Saul is finding himself getting so jealous, so angry. As you look at first, um, Thessal, um, for, first Samuel, you will find that he is getting so frustrated with David and he finds himself overwhelmed. And we see this passage in first Samuel 19 verses 11 through 18. And there's a story that happens where David is really not recognizing that Saul is really going to kill him. And Michael, his wife, who is Saul's daughter, says, buddy, they're going to kill you. And they're like, like David looks out his window and these guys are hanging out there for a period of time, supposedly a significant period of time, looking to take him and kill him. And so Michael one night says, you need to leave, David, because if you don't leave, you're going to die. So Michael lets him out of the window, apparently, down a window, and David goes off into hiding. And then what Michael did was she took a, um, an idol that they had and then put some hair on it. And so when the guys came in the room, she said, yeah, he's in bed, he's sleeping, but he's sick. So the guys go back to Saul and say the guy is sick. And Saul says, I don't care if he's sick, bring him here so I can kill him, right? So then they go back and find out that David's gone and he had been slipped away. Kind of reminds you of how, um, how the spies were let out of Jericho um, by Rahab, the prostitute, or how Paul was saved in the book of Acts, similarly snuck out of the city. Well, David has been snuck out of the city and he is now on the run. And David is writing this psalm to kind of talk about what his struggles are with um, why he is finding himself feeling the way he's feeling overwhelmed. And I've entitled it Waiting and Singing, and hopefully you'll pick it up. Now, I don't know if you caught it as we were reading it, but there is a repeated verse in here. If you look in verse 9, and then in verse 17, there's a repeated verse. It says this in verse 
9, it says, Oh, my strength, I will watch for you, for you, oh God, are my fortress. And now look in verse 17. There's a little bit of a change that happens. It says in verse 17, Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. So it's, it's close that there's a watching and then there's a singing, but primarily David is watching and singing to a God who is his strength. So I, I thought about entitling it God my strength, but I chose waiting and singing. So let's try to talk about that tonight. The outline is going to be pretty simple. I think it's simple, but it may sound complex. We're going to use the two refrains, and then there are two prayers. So David's going to start with a prayer, then he's going to verses one through five. And then what he's going to do is he's going to describe his enemies in verses six through eight. So starts with a prayer, one through five, then verses six through eight, there is a description of the enemies. And then we have the refrain, and the refrain is primarily watching. And then what he does is he doubles up on his appeal to God in verses 10 through 13. And then he doubles up in his description of the enemies in verses 14 through 16. And then he goes back to the refrain. So we've got appeal, description of enemies, refrain, appeal, description of enemies, second refrain. So that's how the um, psalm breaks down. So let's try to um, work through this psalm together. So let's start with the psalmist appeals. The psalmist is going to appeal first to God, verses 1 through 5. Now watch what he does here. He says, David is going to cry for help. And he's going to say this, deliver me from my enemies. Oh my God, protect me from those who rise up against me, verse 1. And so what we find here is that this psalm is filled with urgency. He's crying for help here. He's saying, God, I need you to deliver me right now. You know, when, when I was a kid, we used to have these things. We called them popcorn prayers. Popcorn prayers or sentence prayers, very quick prayers. And what we would do is we would go around the room and you would have to give one quick thing that you wanted to pray for God. No long-winded thing. So, Lord, I pray for um, Diana Kelly. And so, you know, what you're doing is you're praying for somebody right now, and it's just very quick prayers, and we would call them popcorn prayers. Well, that's almost what David is doing right now. He is he's praying for a, a swift prayer, and watch what he says. He says, deliver me, protect me, deliver me in verse 2, save me. Those, those four prayers, right? Deliver me, protect me, deliver me, save me. And he's crying out to God. And so when we're in the midst of our struggles, I think it's real important for us to remember to cry out to God. Um, Alec Motier, he is a co um, commentator. He uses the phrase, grant me top security. I like that. You know, it's like if you could think of the greatest security force that we could have, maybe it's a military force, maybe it's the Secret Service. I have no idea what we would have in our country, but I want... They, they can't come close to God's top security force. So, so in essence, God, grant me top security. Grant me my protection. So grant me the angels. Absolutely. There's no doubt. And so he, he's almost asking that God take him to a place where he's inaccessible, where God is going to remove him from the place where his enemies can grab him and take over him. Look at verses 9. 16 and 17, because there's a repeated idea. He says in verse 9, he says that you are my fortress. In verses 16 and 17, similarly, my fortress again, and then again, my fortress. So he is thinking of this place that God is going to protect him. You're my refuge, my fortress. You're the one that I run to. So David is, is crying for help so important for us to keep in mind. And so look at verse two. He starts to speak about the enemies that he has. And he says, deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. 
So David is going to go into a little bit more of a description of them when we get to uh, a little bit later verses. But David in verses one and two, he gives an initial description of these men. So now if we go back to verse one, he says, deliver me from my enemies. So he calls them enemies. And then he says, protect me from those that rise up against me. There's an active intent in their lives to rise up against me. So David sees them as enemies, but then David also sees them as people that are rising up against him. Maybe you're feeling that way today. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you're finding yourself feeling like they are rising up against me constantly, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, whatever it may be. They're rising up against me. I was, I was a boss, right? I was on, on the phone with my daughter on the way here um, to my other daughter who's down in Florida and she's having some difficulty with um, somebody that she's uh, in relationship with and it feels like she's rising up against her. And it's the same thing, enemies that rise up against. But then he describes them also in verse two. He says, deliver me from those who work evil. They're troublemakers. <clears throat> they are constantly working evil, inventing evil, that God has given us this ability to have a creative mindset. He's given us abilities that the animal world doesn't have. And we use these minds, unfortunately, to work evil. And that's what he's saying. They're troublemakers. But then they, they're not only troublemakers, they're bloodthirsty men. They're ruthless. So David, as he gives the popcorn prayer, deliver me, protect me, deliver me, save me. He's also giving popcorn assessments of these people. They are enemies that rise up against me. They work evil and they are bloodthirsty men. So David is now describing, he's crying out, God help me. And then in verse three, what we see is that David begins to describe the reasons why God should hear his prayers. You ever think about that, that sometimes we find ourselves so discouraged at times and that we honestly believe that God is not hearing our prayers, that our prayers are going no higher than the ceiling. And David gives a couple of reasons why he believes that God should hear his prayers. And, and the first one is this, is that David believes that God should hear his prayers because he is in danger. In verse three, it tells us that David is finding himself, I thought I had verse three up here. I do not, sorry. There is verse three, okay. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me for no transgression of mine, O Lord. So David is in danger. And David is recognizing that these people are against him in a vile way. And then he describes the danger that he's in. And he describes the danger by this. He says that they lie in wait for me. So you can see it almost like an animal ready to pounce. And then he says, not only are they lying in wait, but then he says they are fierce, strong ones. So they're lying in wait, ready to pounce, and they're strong ones. But then what they do is they stir up strife against me. So Saul has been making these accusations about David, but now the men that have come alongside are doing the same thing. They're stirring up more and more strife, getting more and more people. And maybe you've had people in your life that way. They, they talk about you and they say, don't you know what James does? And now you get a group of this people and another group of people. And it's like people are finding themselves talking about you and attacking you. Well, that's what David was going through. David was saying that, you know what, they're lying away from me. They are, they're pouncing on me. And then David is finding himself saying, God, I'm praying that you would hear me because I am in danger. So David believes that he's in danger. And why don't you ask this question? Are you in danger right now? Are you discouraged? Are you worried about the future? What David does and the psalmists do is they call out to God and they cry out to him. What we tend to do in the midst of our dangers, in the midst of our discouragement, in the midst of our fears about the future, we tend to talk to everybody else around us or we talk within our own minds rather than talking to God. And what David said is this, I need to go vertically. I need to go to God and I'm going to God and I'm bringing this to you. God, I'm in danger. I need your help. 
This is the first thing that he does. He says, God, I, I pray that you will hear my prayer because I'm in danger. But there's a second reason that David gives for why God should hear his prayers. And he says this, I believe that God should hear my prayers because I'm innocent. This is huge. David is looking at what is happening and he's hearing all these accusations. He's hearing all these attacks. He's seeing these snarling people around him. And he says, God, I need you to hear my prayer because I'm in danger. But then God, I need you to hear my prayer because I am innocent. He's, he's professing his innocence. And he is saying that I have not done this. I have not failed in this way. Look, look here in verse three. He says this, he says, the wicked are a straight, I'm sorry, wrong. for behold, they lie in wait, fierce men are against me for no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. And verse four, no fault of mine. They make, they run and make ready. So he's making his profession of faith. He says, there's no transgression. There's no sin in me. There is no fault of mine. I've not rebelled against Saul. I've committed no fault against him. He, he could stand very clear that there's no iniquity in my heart when it comes to Saul. It's interesting that if you remember in Psalm 51, verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That confessional psalm, he, he's confessing that I've committed this grave sin with Bathsheba, and I've murdered Uriah, but he says, God, I need you to wash me. I need you to clean me from the inside out. Now, David, David is not claiming here that he is perfectly innocent in sins against God. That's not what he's saying. He's not claiming some sinless perfection. What he is claiming is this, I'm not sinful when it comes to Saul. And we were talking about this last week. How many times did David have an opportunity to kill Saul and he didn't? He says, I will not put my hands on the Lord's anointed. So he said, you know what? This is not true in my own heart towards you, Saul, and my actions towards you. I am innocent. Saul, you're pursuing me without cause. David says, I'm innocent as charged. It's so important. No fault. And as I was thinking about this, our justice system today is quite interesting. Now, the way our land is set up and our justice system is set up, it is set up as though you are innocent until what? Proven guilty, right? That is a biblical concept. The concept is that you need to have the burden of proof is upon who? The accuser. the accuser, the prosecution or the accuser has the burden of proof. I don't have to try to prove my innocence. You have to prove my guilt. But exactly, that's exactly what we've done, exactly opposite. And it's going back to what's happening here with David. David says, I am completely innocent. I have no fault here. But they, the burden of proof is now upon David to try to prove himself innocent rather than Saul trying to prove himself guilty. Proverbs 18, 17 um, says this, the one who states his case first seems right until the other one comes and examines it. Uh, have you ever found it where somebody is um, claiming something and you hear something and they tell you a story and it's like, wow, that really sounds pretty true, right? And then all of a sudden you get the other person's side of the story and it's like, oh, that's not what I heard. And so now what happens, you get both sides here. So, so I want you to consider this. Um, this application. How do you handle it when you're falsely accused? When somebody is saying something against you, how do you tend to respond? We, we have a tendency to defend ourselves, to promote ourselves. And it could seem like David is defending himself and promoting himself. I don't think he really is. I think what he is saying is this, that God, you know me, you know this is not the case. What we're going to see in the second part is that God is more concerned with God's glory. David is more concerned with God's glory than he is in with even his own vindication. So I worry, I got one figure out, three fingers point back. When somebody is attacking my character, am I 
more concerned with God's glory or am I more concerned with my reputation? In 1 Peter, it's interesting. Peter says, we're all going to be persecuted if you're a part of the church, but be persecuted. Be persecuted for evil. So that brings me to the second thing that I was thinking about is this Are we able to appeal boldly to God because we're, we have a conscience that is clear? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like David was able to run to God and say, God, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent because he was what? Innocent. innocent. You know, I do a lot of counseling and, you know, oftentimes you will have um, you will have somebody who is probably more the offender and somebody that is more the offended. You can have imbalance in those relationships. But I can't remember in 30 years of counseling where I have somebody who is the perfectly innocent one who's done absolutely nothing wrong and the one that has done all of it wrong. The reality is, is that even when I am mistreated, because of my sinful tendency, I could probably do things that are out of pride, out of self-promotion or self-protection. And David is able to say with a clear conscience, I, I didn't do this. And I wonder how often we can do that. David then goes on in verse 4b and he says, awake, come to me and see. He's almost... He's almost envisioning that God is sleeping, which he doesn't. And it's like, God, I need you to arouse yourself and come and protect me here because I'm in danger and I'm innocent. And what I love this is what David does next. He goes and he goes vertical. Watch what he says in verse five. He says, you, O Lord, Lord God of hosts, are the God of Israel. And so he's the God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations, spare none of those who treacherously plot evil, Selah. So what David does is he remembers and reassures himself with the powerful names of God. And in just that, he's bullet points here, right? You know, I talked about those sentence prayers in the beginning, those popcorn prayers, and then the popcorn descriptions of the people now he's doing the same thing he's looking and if you go back to the verse he says lord you lord capital l capital o capital r capital d and we've talked about this before that is the name yahweh jehovah it is the name that god gave to moses at sinai it is i am who i am god is saying i am the self-existent one so David starts by saying, Lord, he's saying the self-existent one. I'm calling out to Yahweh. I'm calling out to Jehovah. That's who I'm calling out to. But then he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, Lord. He says, God of hosts. And God of hosts is an interesting word. Uh, what it means is Elohim Salvayoth. And what it means is that he's the God of the armies of Israel and the God of the heavenly host. But it's a little bit different here. The better translation is not only the God of hosts, he is the God who is host. He's the God of all power. It's not just that he has a powerful army, like a president has a powerful army that he can put out there, that the power is not in the president primarily, it's in the army that he puts out there. It's God who is the power that gives the power to this host. He's the God who is host. So he's not only Lord, he's not only Elohim Sabaoth, God of hosts, but he's also God of Israel. He's the God of Israel. He is Elohim Israel. He is his people are Israel. He's talking about the eternal covenant that God has with his people. So David hits, he says, God, you're Jehovah. Lord of hosts, almighty, God who's covenantal, he's wham, wham, wham. That's the God. That he's looking at the enemies around him, and he wants to make his God big in his eyes. And that's he's envisioning this. But he's not only envisioning Lord, not only envisioning a God, Lord God of hosts, or God of Israel, but he's also envisioning the God who is the judge of all people. Leopold says this. He says that 
The writer recalls God's unique power by employing the various most familiar names by which he is known in Israel. Lord, Jehovah, God of hosts, and then finally, that God who is God of Israel. David knew that God is a judge and that God was going to judge all people. And I, I was also thinking about this. When I am attacked by people, how often is it that I think about the fact that Christ is going to come back one day and I will stand before God and I really only have one judge. I may have hundreds of human judges, but in the final analysis, though, those are just small courts. The ultimate court that I will stand up against in front of will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, he is going to judge me innocent in his sight, righteous in his sight. So David knew his innocence, and David was confident that if he stood before God, he would stand before God as, as righteous in his sight, not because of anything that David had done, but because of what God had done for him. So now what David does is now he describes the enemies. He describes the enemies. I should go back for a moment to Selah. Verse 5. And we've talked about this. There are two Selahs in this passage. The first one here is that um, right after verse 5, he is talking about you, Lord Jehovah, God of hosts, the all-powerful one, God of Israel. He is not praying to a weak God. He has a relationship with him. He's not praying to a weak God. He's praying to a God who's self-existent, God of armies of Israel, God who's the covenantal God. That's who he's praying to. And then he says, pause. Selah. Selah means just to pause. Take a breath and think about that. Let that roll around in your mind and ponder it. Be encouraged and be comforted by that God in the midst of the struggles. Okay, that's verses one through five. Verses six through eight, David now describes his enemies. Now we've given some quick descriptions of his enemies previously. And if you remember, they were enemies, they were prowling around, they were treacherous, bloodthirsty men who work evil. That's what he said quickly. Well, now David is going to describe them in more detail. And let's look at verse six. In verse six, he says, each evening, each evening, they came back howling like dogs and prowling around the city. Now, my friend is sitting over here. I don't even know how many dogs she has, but she has a number of dogs um, and she loves animals. But back in this culture, animals, dogs were not pets. Dogs, we couldn't, we couldn't afford to feed ourselves, so we couldn't clearly couldn't afford to feed the dogs. So dogs were not household pets for the most part. Dogs were scavengers who round, uh, went around the city. And what he's doing is he's calling his enemies dogs. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But I want you to see the persistence. He says each evening. So it's the persistence of these evil people. They come back over and over again, howling like dogs. And so David says they keep coming back, they keep returning. He likens them to dogs. The dogs at this time were scavengers. They encircle him and they're looking to attack him. And that's how he sees his enemies. These enemies are just looking to attack him. He goes on in verse seven and he says this, there they are bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips for who they think will hear us. Uh, the Proverbs often talk about this, that we have this tendency with our tongues to have sword thrust, just attacking people. And that is what's happening with these men. These men that are coming against David are just attacking him verbally over and over again. And David speaks of their words. He will do this even more so in verse 12 when we get there. But for the time being, I want you to think about him just spewing. These people are spewing hatred against him. And once again, I was thinking about our, our media today. The, the world we live in today, People just get on to Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it may be, and they just spew out this hatred against people. And there is something about attacking somebody where I don't have to stand face to face with you. So I could just say these things, even maybe anonymously say these things and just put it out there for the world to see. And I put it out there. And then what ends up happening is because people do not judge where we, we believe today that people are guilty and they need to prove themselves innocent. As soon as this statement goes out there, 
the person is viewed as guilty. And the spewing, the hatred, I can't even watch the news today because the vitriol that goes out is overwhelming. So David is saying that, you know what, God, they are attacking me. They are in great case of me. So I want you to think about this prayer. Lord, save me from the sins of my tongue and that the flaws of my character that fuel them. That I, I want you to think how often is it that the words that come out of your mouth once again, or a byproduct of what's happening in your heart. Save me from the sins of my tongue. The tongue is this restless evil, full of deadly poison, James says. Mm -hmm. it, out of the tongue, it's amazing that we can come out of a worship service this morning, praising God, what an amazing service we had, and then go out there and curse our spouse, or our children, or our friends, or the driver on the road. Out of the same mouth comes praising and cursing, James says, my brothers, this should not be. I want you to think about this. Make my words honest. I love this. Tim Keller wrote this. Make my words honest by taking away my fears. Few by taking away my self-importance. Wise by taking away my thoughtlessness. And kind by taking away my indifference and irritability. Is that in the papers you read this um, they are. So they're on the site. They're on the site. Yes, so you'll have them today. Uh, sure, I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Honest, few, wise, and kind. Honest, few, wise, and kind. Interesting. Honest, if I take away my fears, few, by taking away my self-importance, wise by taking away my thoughtlessness and kind by taking away my difference and irritability. What an amazing um, life we would have if we could actually make our words that way. Verse eight, but you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold them in derision. It's almost as if God dismisses them. It's like they mount up all their forces and they're going against his his chosen one here, the one who's going to be king, and God is like almost saying, <laughs> you got to be kidding me, this is a joke. He's the absolute authority, he's the absolute strength, and these people are going against him in derision. Uh, in Psalm 24, it, it's, I'm sorry, verse chapter 2, verse 4, it's similar. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs and holds them in derision. You and I, may be intimidated by the world. God is not. You and I may be intimidated by the person that your boss, your family member, your friend, your neighbor, you may be intimidated by them. God is not. And so David was able to have great confidence in a big God in the midst of what seemed to be insurmountable fears and insecurities that were happening around him. I guess I wonder how big is your God? He who sits in heaven laughs at them. Proverbs 30, um, Psalm 37, verse 13, but the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. And so now what he does is he moves to this refrain. Now I told you that there are two refrains here. Uh, we're going to spend um, a little time on this one. We'll spend more time on the last one. I'm just going to kind of do a high level um, of the second section because I told you it duplicated. So in Psalm um, 59, verse 9, it says this. It says, oh, my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O oh Lord, or O oh God, are my fortress. So David is recognizing that these enemies are coming around him, and he sees God as his strength. He says, I will watch for you, and you are my fortress. I want you to focus on the word watch. I told you that in the second um, refrain, he talks about singing. He replaced singing, watching with singing, which is interesting. And in the Hebrew, it's only one letter difference between watching and singing. Same word, just change the letter a little bit, and it becomes watching or singing. And David is saying that I am, I'm watching for you, God. 
I'm focusing on you. And it, it got me thinking about where do I put my eyes when I'm going through the worst trials in my life? I, I tend to look horizontally. I tend to look back. I tend to look here. I tend to look ahead. I tend to look all of these places rather than looking up. And what David says is I'm looking up to you. And David uses four references. He, he, talked about, he talked about the strength of these people, but he's looking at the strength of his God. His God is the all-powerful one, which is so important. So I, I want you to think about this. Where do you fix your eyes? David fixed his eyes on God. And he's on the run. He's surrounded by his enemies. But he says, I am going to put my eyes on God. And we're called to, in Hebrews, fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. See, David's testimony is that his testimony is that I can trust God. So I, I want you to think of that application. Keep your eyes fixed on God. Fix your eyes on Jesus as you go through the trials and the troubles that you have. Okay, so that's the first half of the psalm. And now we go to the second half. We'll go through the second half much more quickly. Um, so in the second appeal, David's second appeal to God starts in verse 10, and he says, my God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. So David is making his second appeal to God, and he is saying, God, I've been watching for you. I've got my eyes on you, and that you are my God. Now, I didn't show you in the last one, but let me just go back a couple of verses. You see this? My strength, and you are my fortress. I want you to see this, that David is seeing God as not just a God who's up in heaven, who's all powerful, but he's a personal God. And he sees the same thing here in verse 10. My God in his steadfast love will meet me and that he will look on me and triumph on my enemies. He, he sees God as personal. And you and I need to do the same, that as we go through the troubles and the trials in our lives, this is, this is so important that you ramp your focus and vision on Christ and see him as intimate with you. Now, as David goes into the second half of this psalm, he's going to repeat some of those same things, but he's going to ramp it up. And he's also going to look at these enemies, not just attacking him personally, but then he's going to think about the nation. So as we read through it, let's pick up some of that. In verse 11, he says that, kill them not, which is interesting, lest my people forget Make them totter by your power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. So I, when you start here, kill them not. That's not what I was expecting David to say. These enemies, these dogs that are attacking me, they're attacking me with their words. Now they want to kill me. Saul is attacking me. Why wouldn't I want him to God to kill them? Exactly. Lest my people forget. So David gives three reasons why he says, I don't want you to take care of them that way. First, lest my people forget. He says, God, I want you to give a lesson to your people, Israel. I want you to treat these enemies in such a way that it is a lesson to your people, number one. So if God just to wipe them out and annihilated them, I don't know if it would be as much of a lesson as if God slowly but surely ripped the kingdom away from Saul. So David says, teach my people a lesson, Lord. Teach your people a lesson. But then the second thing is this. I don't want them to miss out. I want them to be punished, and I want them to totter, and I want them to be torn down, and I want them to be viewed and punished for these sins, terrible sins. And what David does is he focuses on the sins of their words. Look at this. He says, for the sins of their mouths, their words, their lips, they've trapped me with their pride, their cursing and lying. So what David is saying is that most of the evil that he is seeing starts with the words that they're saying, but it's ultimately coming from their heart. So David says that, number one, what's motivating David right now is that God would give a lesson to his people Israel. But then second, he is motivated by the fact that, God, I want you to punish them for their evil, punish them for the things that they've done. But then the third reason why David wants them to be dealt with, not only a lesson for Israel, 
And not only so that they will be punished, these people will be punished, but the third reason is verse 13. Consume them in your wrath, consume them till they are no more, that they may know what? That God rules. He wants God's glory to be made um, powerful here. So yes, God, I want you to give them a lesson, verse 11. And yes, I want you to punish these evil people, verse 12. But I want God's name to be made great. What does it mean by no more? Gone. He doesn't want them. They're ultimately going to be killed eventually. They're ultimately, Saul is ultimately going to leave them. But just to annihilate them initially would not teach Israel the lesson that slowly but surely to see Saul's anger and David's righteousness. David, if Saul was killed immediately, David would not be able to have had the opportunity to save Saul on multiple occasions to prove once again that I am acting in a righteous way towards you, Saul, and your wife working in a, in a wrong way towards me. The people of Israel saw that. David's men could see that, that you had a chance to kill this guy and you didn't. Because you make God big in your life. And then God gave you the throne that he promised to give you. So God's name gets glorified because he rules. Saul doesn't rule. And so God is glorified. And that's what David says. What's motivating me? Teach Israel. What's motivating me? Give them their enemy. Give them their due. But what's motivating me is that all the earth may know that you are the sovereign ruler. I don't know. Is that... Your passion is that mine. So David gives a second description of his enemies. Let's look at this real quick. Verses 14 and following. He says, again, the evening they come back howling. Okay, snarling, howling, prowling. You see this encircling thing. Verse 15, he says, they wander about for food and they growl. That's kind of murmuring. And they do not get their fill. That's what I want to focus on. You probably have heard this quote by St. Augustine. St. Augustine said this, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are what? Restless until it finds its rest in you. And you know, that's what sin does. Sin wants to tell you that it will satisfy you, but sin will never fill you, never will. St. Augustine also went on and he says that when we go after anything but God, we will leave hungry, lonely, and enslaved, which is interesting. Hungry. I constantly, these savages are constantly looking for more, but they can't get their fill. Lonely. You think it's going to draw relationships to you. It doesn't. And enslaved. More enslaved. Saul became more and more enslaved to his jealousy and to his anger over and over again. But David did something else. David says, I will sing. I'll sing of your strength. I'll sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. I will sing. <laughs> I just, I love that. He, he makes he makes this intention of his heart. He says, I'm not going to get so focused on these people. I'm going to find my rest in you. you I'm going to sing. Aloud. Aloud. Passion. Yeah. Right. It's a, oh, I will sing of the Lord forever. He is like right. passionate. You're right. Because he sees God as his fortress, his security. He sees God as his refuge, his, his place of place to flee to. He can run to God. We can run to Christ instead of being overwhelmed with the people that are around him and overwhelmed with fear. David was overwhelmed with a glory of God. And that leads us to the last refrain. He starts singing. Verse 17. He says, Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. So I told you that there is only one word change between singing and watching. So I'll bring it to a close with this. Why was David able to sing? It's amazing testimony. Nothing has changed. 
I don't know how many times I tell my clients that, you know, they sit in the office or sit in a meeting. We sit there for 45 minutes and a number of times people come in really discouraged. And then by the end of the session, they're less discouraged. And I'll say to them, well, what has changed? What in the circumstances of your life have changed? The people are still attacking you. The enemies are still around you and still encamping. What has changed? And what has changed is that God has become bigger than us. It's the only thing that has changed. And that's what's happened with David. His circumstances have changed, haven't changed. What has changed is that he has gone from watching to God to singing about God. So I think the more that we cast our vision on who God is, the more God is going to make himself big. So do you lack joy right today? Is it hard for you to sing God's praises today? Shouldn't be. I wonder if it is because we're not watching. We're fixing our eyes on you. And that's why we look to King David, great David's greater son. His greater son who had enemies and snarling around him. He had enemies that were verbally attacking him. He had enemies that beat him. Jesus gave himself into their hands. David didn't have to suffer the punishment that Jesus did. And Jesus suffered that punishment for David and for me and you. He lived a perfectly righteous life. He died a horrific death. But he rose victoriously. And so we will stand before King Jesus because he rose victoriously. He ascended on high. He seated his father's right hand. And believe it or not, he is praying for you. We are called to pray to him, but he is praying to, for you right now at his father's right hand, interceding for you. When you sin, he says to his father, I've got that covered. So there is there for now, no condemnation. So live, live free, live with hope, live with peace, live with joy. All right, let's pray. So, Father, we uh, help us to watch and help us to sing. Father, we spend a lot of time watching the wrong things. I was talking about listening and watching the news and all the stuff that goes on. And sometimes we could take in all of this garbage and then we spew it out on social media, Father. And and, and we hear of this thing and we know, oh, that guy must be guilty. And it's like, but we didn't hear the evidence. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be very careful about judging others because we would not want anybody judging us that way. And Father, for King David, he was judged with such wrongness over and over by Saul, but you vindicated David. I thank you for the fact that you vindicated us as well. I also thank you more importantly for the fact that you could have judged each one of us to a condemnation in hell. And by God's, your grace, you sent your son to live the life we could never live and die the death in our place so that we are justified. We are righteous in your sight, not by our character, not by our conduct, but by the character and conduct of Christ, that we're righteous in your sight. We are your children. We are never condemned any longer, and we are never separated from your love. Help us to be so overwhelmed with that. And help us to see you as our refuge, our fortress, our very present help in this time of trouble. In Jesus' name.